know when you're little and you just love asking those tough questions. I mean, you'll ask, why is the sky blue, or why is it dark out, or even the infamous, where do babies come from? We know parents just love that one, right? Well, I asked a slightly different question. I asked my mom, what is family? Now I know, it doesn't sound like a big deal or anything, but when I grew up, I had a slightly different home life. My mom and my dad worked fairly long hours. My dad would literally leave before I woke up and get home after I went to bed. So, I had to learn to adapt, and I became independent from a very young age. So, once I learned about family in school, I was clearly caught off guard. I mean, I saw pictures of families running off of the sunset together, but I could barely remember the last time my parents tucked me in together. This innocent question made my mom break down into tears. It also caused her to leave her job. But, even at home, I could still see how hardworking she was. Now, she had to do all the home chores and still find time to play with a whiny, gross five-year-old, also known as me. My mom has always been used to making sacrifices for her family. She grew up in a poor household in the suburbs of Brazil during a military dictatorship. So she was used to working from a very young age, and it's most definitely made her a workaholic. But I think it's paid off, because it was also through work that my mom and my dad. When they first met, my dad had just started working for Colgate Palmolive. Back then, he was 22. Today, he's 46. And according to some quick math, that's about 24 years. And it's almost two times my age. Not to make you feel old or anything. But Colgate was and will always be his first child. He has worked long hours to make sure everyone in this plant is as safe as possible. He was in charge of creating and enforcing the COVID-19 protection guidelines in his plant. And without him, the plant wouldn't be where it is today. Yet I still see people look down on us. I still see people judge my parents and question their credibility and skills. But I'm here to say that a person's work ethic does not depend on what they look like or where they came from. Would you like it if someone came up to you and assumed you were dumb because you're blonde? Or they assumed you're weak because you're a girl? Probably not. So why do we continuously generalize groups of people based on what they look like? I want you to take a second and think of the worst thing someone could label you as is. Got it? Well, for me, this label is lazy. And sadly, it's a really common one to describe immigrants. I often feel pressure to be the perfect girl next door. I'm scared of making even the smallest mistakes because it's going to give people one more reason, just one more reason, to look down on me. So, in my experience as an immigrant, there really is no average. You're either above average, or you're nothing. This puts a lot of pressure on us from a very young age. So we have to learn to adapt without the help of our parents, because they're usually working or may not know the language as well. As I was crying over my math homework, as any fifth grader would do, right? I asked my mom for help. I mean, she's an accountant, she can help me with a simple division problem, right? But I was wrong. They taught division in Brazil so different than how they teach it here that she couldn't help me. I quickly learned that I was on my own with school, and I was on my own with everything about school, and this included fitting in. In elementary school, I was bullied for having an accent. So, I would get home and I would cry, but then I would repeat words over and over and over again until I got them correct. I was only nine back then, though. A nine-year-old shouldn't have to worry about those things. So what? I had a cute little accent. But I was so ashamed of it that I wouldn't play with the other girls at recess. To this day, I still make small changes to myself. And I really do hate to say it, but it impacts things as small as the decisions I make for packing my lunch or plans I make for my future. As a young, impressionable girl, I know it's hard being different, and I know it's hard for everyone else, too. But we can't let this feeling determine our self-worth. This is why I stand before you today. You are the only person that gets to determine who you are. No one else can put labels on you or say if you're worthy or not. My journey as an immigrant has taught me to be more proud of being different and embracing that within our universal family. So this is what I want to shine a light on today. My mom has been my biz biggest example of this. She never got the chance to learn English with a child, but she doesn't let this hold her back. She goes to school every single day to learn more about the English language. 
She was even a part of our city's Italian for New Americans. In this program, refugees and immigrants came together to learn more about things that Americans overlook as common knowledge. Everyone became a big family in that program, and it was so beautiful to see. The program also allowed the population to be studied. In this study, it was found that the foreign-born population in my state contributes over $564 million to the gross domestic product, but they made up less than 10% of our population. The more I researched the contribution of the foreign-born population, the more it made me wonder why we get such a bad reputation. The Congressional Budget Office has repeatedly shown that immigrants only increase the labor force and the economic output. We're also liable to the same exact taxes and laws that apply to native-born citizens. I think people will judge because it's easier to forget the incredible impact that immigrants have had on the United States and their culture. So, let's talk about it. Over 10 million people moved to the United States through Ellis Island in the end of the 1800s and beginning of the 1900s. These 10 million people are most likely your ancestors. The ancestors of today's native-born population. I mean, just think about your favorite food, clothing item, or movie. It was probably created thanks to the amazing ideas brought over by immigrants. And they continue to bring over amazing ideas. Forbes has shown that over 55% of the billion dollar, yes, billion with a B, startup companies in the U.S. had at least one immigrant founder. I mean, you've probably heard of a small company called Uber. Well, it was founded by Canadian immigrant Garrett Kim. You've probably also heard of an even smaller company called SpaceX, or maybe Tesla. Well, it was founded by South African immigrant Elon Musk. These people have created innovations that have changed your life for the better. And in the future, they're going to continue changing your life. Brookings Institute showed that immigrants are much more likely to go on to college and get advanced degrees than the, the native born population. Immigrants come to the U.S. with big dreams of motivation. They refuse to be average. So why are we not welcome anymore? America used to be known as a welcoming place and a cultural melting pot. So why are we standing in the way of that now? I think we usually get caught up in the political side of this fight. Just for a couple of minutes, I ask that you step back and forget all about politics. We can start off easy. Think about your own family. Think about all the hardships you've been through, or your mom cooking you breakfast in the morning, or that one time that you're so scared to learn how to ride a bike, but your dad was right there holding you up. Or when you met your best friend in the entire world the playground at recess. Now, take another step back. And think about immigrants. They have gone through hardships. Their moms make delicious breakfast, let me tell you. They had to learn how to ride their bikes and make best friends too. So it makes you different. Sure, you may not look the same or speak the same language, but you both grew up and made amazing memories with your families. Why are we letting our culture build a space between us? In the past, this might have made sense. I mean, there might have been oceans or mountains between two places, but today, we have technology that breaks these barriers like that. So why are we still letting it stand between us? In my city, we like to build a bridge between our cultures by hosting an annual international festival. At our international festival, countries from all over the world are welcome to show their culture off and teach other people. Everyone loves the International Festival, and people will stand in line for over 40 minutes just to get their favorite foreign dish. It's so beautiful to see everyone come together as a family for that one weekend. And I've even seen this happen on a wider scale. I was going through social media the other day, and I saw something that warmed my heart. A young girl was looking for some new white style of hair. I mean, girls, we've all been there, right? You're rushing out of the house, but you have nothing to do with your hair. An African-American girl then made a video to show how to lay her edges. It was a one-minute video, but it got over a million views and hundreds of thousands of likes. Two teenagers brought two communities together. So, seeing that made me think of a family. We were working to teach each other and help each other get better. So, 10 years later, I stand before you knowing what family means. 
A family is made up of those who will work to do what's best for you, to help you be the best you. And this is what my amazing immigrant parents did for me. The fact they weren't born here does not change everything they've sacrificed for me. After all, the words American and Brazilian are only adjectives modifying the word family. Back in kindergarten, we learned to not judge a book by its cover, but we're still letting stereotypes determine how we view certain people. I hope that this will help you look past these silly stereotypes. I know it's hard. I'm human too. But isn't that the point? We're all human. We all make mistakes. But most of all, we all deserve love, no matter our race, gender, sexuality, or political beliefs. We're all a part of the same universal family. Thank you.